This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The long homestand is over and the Flames go on the road. But before they do, as always, I'm Dan alongside my co-host Matt, and we're here to break down the last week of Flames hockey. Matt, what do you think of the end of this homestand? Well, that game against St. Louis was one of the best games I've seen from Calgary in a long time. You know, just as a hockey fan, that was a fun game. Yeah. Just the back and, it, and forth. And- yeah, and it was nice to see Sam Bennett get a goal. You know, it, it, you can tell that... He's been fighting it a long time, so it's good for him to get one and get that monkey off his back, and hopefully he can just relax and do his thing instead of, oh, I haven't scored, and, you know. Well, before we look at that one, let's start with the Vancouver game and work our way backwards. Uh, The Vancouver game, Calgary lost this game 5-2. Thomas Vanek had a golden assist in his 900th career game, while Jacob Markstrom made 29 saves in Calgary's 5-3 win. Thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, this was a game where if the Flames play that game 100 times, they probably win that game 95 times. It's just that, unfortunately, that was one of the times that they lost, and they played very well. Johnny Gaudreau was on fire in that game had at least a half dozen quality shots towards net. The goaltender was just on his game. Unfortunately, sometimes you run into a goalie doing good things, and that's that. We've been running into too many of those so far this season. True, but you could see that the whole team was playing well. It's just the the goaltender was getting in the way. It wasn't like the Flames were just doing okay. And, like, the Flames could have easily scored seven or eight goals in this game. It's just, unfortunately, it is what it is. Yeah, you're right. If this is a good game for the Flames, I think this is one where both teams put out a, a good effort. The Flames put out a better effort. And I think that they just, like you said, they got stumped by a hot Jacob Markstrom. And it's one of those things where you've got to learn as a team that you can't always win, but you've still got to have that high compete level. Oh, for sure, and that never-say-die attitude and just keep going even if you, your team allows some goals that weren't great and you just, you know, if you lose that one, you come back the next one and try to go for it again. Well, let's move on to the next game the Calgary Flames played, and it's weird to be thinking of Detroit as sort of a, I don't want to say a basement team, but a team that's in a rebuild because you just think of them as a dominating team. And this was the game where Yermer Yager scored his first goal with the Flames, and Johnny Goudreau added two tallies. Mark Jankowski scored his first goal of the year as the Calgary Flames ended up winning 6-3 to three over, the Red Wing, over the Red Wings. Secondary scoring. Thank God. <laughs> well, that's it. It finally emerged, right? I mean, we saw Jankowski score. We saw um, Kachuk score. I don't know if we'd really classify him secondary. We saw Yermer Yager get his first goal. This was... I thought this was a really good Flames effort. There were some things they needed to tighten up, but this is one of those games that really builds momentum for a team. Yeah, and this uh, team uh, up until that point was 8-7, and seven, and that's without any contributions from the third and fourth line. So they were still an above-average team. It's just not getting any depth scoring. And... With both the Detroit and the St. Louis games, the depth started to score. Now, if that continues, which really it should, then the Flames could go on a protracted run in the next little while. As Because if they're getting scoring from all four lines, it's impossible for teams to contain them all. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, if you take out the depth guys in in these games that, you know, 
they were scoring. Even in this one, you got about four goals by the top two lines. The Flames still win, but it's those goals from Jankowski, those goals from Yager, that really helped to cement that win. And that's what you need in the NHL. You can't be winning by one goal. You're gonna, you know, you're not gonna win every game by one goal. No, and you look back to the Flames teams it after the first lockout in 2005 that the the team they were good, but they didn't have that depth of talent in the third and fourth lines. They were very much a first and a second line team and then just defense the rest of the way. And that limited the Flames ability to actually move into a, being a contender those years. And now this team has that depth where if, say, Gaudreau doesn't have a good night, you can still get contributions from other players and still win those games even if it, the first line is quiet. Whereas like in the Aginla years, if Aginla didn't do anything, most nights the Flames lost. So it will help the team emerge as one of the top teams in the West. And I think you'll find any top team in, in either conference, West or East, has more than two good lines. I mean, they're getting scoring all the way up the line. And even if it's not Goudreau having a bad night, teams know that Goudreau is going to be the guy who's going to try to put the, the puck on net. So even if they are just, you know, putting their guys out there to make it hard for him to score, someone else needs to be able to do that. Oh, definitely. And that having the 3M line out there, that's another top end line. And then if Bennett, Jankowski, and Yager click and start going, then you, in effect, have three first slash second lines. And it, the other teams, they only have typically four good defensemen, if that. So you're going to be getting matchups where you're one of those lines is going to be playing against some rather mediocre defensemen. And hopefully those players can capitalize on those opportunities. Well, let's, I think a great example of that is the St. Louis game. Why don't we jump over there? This was, I think the best 60 minutes of flames hockey. I can remember seeing played. Yeah, and honestly, the 7-4 score flatters St. Louis. And it could have easily been 10 to 2. So, it, I think I think it could be higher on both sides. I think that Mike Smith looked good. I think Eddie Lack looked a little shaky and I think that they could have scored a few more on him. So I think that there could have been a few extra goals on both sides. I think it could have been 10 to 2, but I also think it could have been like 8 to 6. True. Um, but why don't we talk about that while we're talking about the goaltenders? So Mike Smith, of course, started this game for the Flames. And in the first period, um, Kachuk fell on his head. And after the first period, we were told as media that uh, Mike Smith told Eddie Lack going to the dressing room. He said, you're going to have to jump in because he knew he couldn't go. And coming out for the start of the second, Eddie Lack was in net surprisingly and Eddie Lack um ha saved 12 of 14 shots for a save percentage of uh, 0.87 and he played pretty much 40 minutes on the ice so what do you think of Eddie Lack in this one he made the important save when he had to and like there was nothing that he could have done with the the uh either of the goals that he surrendered like Furland unfortunately the puck went off his stick deflections they either hit you or go in that one it went in and the Tarasenko goal give me a break you have the second best sniper in the entire NHL in the slot with a one-timer on a pass across from a on a two-on-one no goalie is going to stop that with any regularity so it is what it is I'm it Lack made a good save late in the period uh, that helped kept keep the Flames in the lead. Uh, the one uh, kick save that he made. And when it was important, he came through. I'm not concerned with his play at all. 
I thought that for a guy who's really had one start, I mean, he's played a total of three games now. Um, I thought he looked good, and that's why I think you bring in guys who have starting experience as your backup because he was ready to step in. He, you know, yeah, I, I thought he looked a little bit shaky, but that's to be understandable when you don't play a lot. But yeah, he, he looked good. I'm. I know a lot of people are worried about Lack going forward. I think we got to give him a chance, and I think that he looked good enough to earn a little bit more confidence from the Sea of Red. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm not concerned about Eddie Lack at all. The team. Having such a good defense allows the team to cover up some averageness from a goaltender. So, like, if Lack's just okay in that, that should be fine. Like, uh, unless he's giving up, like, goals that, you know, like, anti Niemi caliber goals, <laughs> then, you know, then there's a problem, but... He hasn't shown that to this point, so with Smith being likely out for Detroit and possibly more, we'll see. Uh, I don't see there being much of a problem with riding with him as the starter until Smith returns. We'll come back to the goalie issue in a bit. Let's finish up this uh, St. Louis game. I don't know if you noticed it, but I was wondering last night, I was thinking, who is wearing number 36? Because it sure isn't uh, Troy Brower. He looked like a totally different player last night. Brower, I think this is the best defensive game we've seen from him. And again, probably his best game ever in a Flaming Sea. Uh, I wouldn't go best game ever, but he's... He's, starting... he's had some better offensive games, but I thought this was his best complete game. Yeah. He's getting there, and it with him, it's been a bit of an up-and-down season where like he's had some good stretches and then some bad stretches, but I think having him on a line with Lazar and Versteeg allows him to be in more of an offensive situation than with just staging, and I think the... He's getting more comfortable in his role on the team. Like, he's not being relied on to be the scorer. He's just being relied on to be a good player, period. And as long as he's just do it, playing his game effectively, that's all you can ask. And the Flames don't need him to be a 40, 50 point player. It, they just need him to do his thing be effective penalty killer, be physical, and if he can chip in a couple points here and there, that's awesome. In this game, we saw nine points come from the bottom six forwards. Would you say, Matt, that finally we've seen the secondary scoring floodgates open? Well, I think that uh, having those guys relax a little bit and not be so uptight about oh I haven't scored in this many games and all that kind of stuff it will help things just flow a little easier and they're not going to be gripping the sticks as hard so like you look at Jankowski and like he was getting scoring chances through the first eight games he played but he, you could see that like even he was fighting it a bit then he has one bounce off of him in the Detroit game. And then all of a sudden, he's relaxed. And the two goals that he scored were both fantastic. And Bennett, he bounced one in off the goalie. And hopefully he too starts showing just more general comfort on the ice. And allows his natural abilities to start shining again. Don't forget, we also got a goal from Versteeg, assisted by Brower and Lazar. Yeah, and Versteeg, he's had a bit of a slow start to the season, but he's starting to come around a bit as well, so you can't complain. As long as players aren't disappearing, basically, where they just are not contributing on either end of the ice, then it's fine. And say like Browers or Bennett not producing, well, they're 
slowly doing the right things and the results will come it's just it wasn't up until that point and now things are starting to come so hopefully they get on a bit of a roll and perhaps a hot streak in which case then you have four lines all contributing and have fun with that to the other teams yeah, I think that we've. St- I think that we're going to see a lot more secondary scoring now that these guys are on a roll and know they can do it. I think, especially Janko, I'm expecting he's probably going to be, let's say, point per game on the road trip. I could see it. I think uh, having Yager, who played with a similar style of player in Alex Barkov, Barkov's obviously a better pro- player, but. It- he can help teach Jankowski the same things that he taught Barkov and how, especially with how to protect the puck better. And you've even seen that in the last couple of games that Jankowski has been a little bit harder to knock up the puck off of since playing with Yager even. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that line fares. I wouldn't be shocked if the, they really start taking off now that Yager's back. The other thing I can see, and I mean, Yager hasn't acknowledged this, but I can also see Yager as sort of the selfless guy on the team. Everybody's looking to get their points. Everyone's looking to, you know, get their numbers up there. And I can see Yager sometimes maybe, you know, giving the extra pass to one of the younger kids or letting them get the goal. Cause he's really got nothing left to, left to prove and they've got a lot to prove. So I can see Yager almost, you know, acting as that guy who, okay, I'm going to give this one over there when, you know, maybe I could have scored it or, you know, make that extra pass onto the open net, that sort of thing. Yeah. And he's taking the role of like player coach to heart and he's sitting with, all of the players and like you can even see it whenever they pan to him on the bench he's always talking with both Bennett and Jankowski and like giving them pointers on things that they're doing on the ice to try and get them to do things more his way which obviously was kind of effective for his NHL career so you know and with those players learning those lessons that will just help round out their games entirely and hopefully make them better players moving forward after this season and beyond. Well, another player, I guess, while we're talking about comfort level and being comfortable, Matt, are you comfortable with Yager on line three and Furland on line one for the remainder of the season, barring we have no trades or injuries? I know when a couple of weeks ago you and I talked about when Yager came back, should he have gone on line one? Should he have gone on line three? It looks like right now Furland is seen as, for right or wrong, Furland is seen as the top line right winger. Well, Furland at the beginning of the season was not playing with any physicality whatsoever, and because of that, it threw off his entire game, and he was struggling. And that's where it the question marks came up of, well, do we need somebody better there? Because you had expectations that he'd be doing the job, and he wasn't. But he's since reintroduced that physicality, and magically the offense has returned as well because he's creating space for himself on the ice and he's just feeling more himself you can see it in how he's playing that he's getting to the right places again instead of being a little hesitant which that's what it looked like in the beginning of the season so if Ferland continues to play like this where he's just being physical and generating offense there's no need to run out and make a trade if that does stop then that creates a little bit of a problem and the flames will need to address it but well, even barring it, a trade i mean would you just switch him and yager it, potentially and like that would be the first thing is just scramble the lines and see if it works but the first thing i would do would be to put yager up there and if none of that works for the long term then look outside the team but uh, as of right now there's no need to rock the boat it's everything seems to be working just fine and dandy as it is 
I know a lot of people want Yager on that first line. I think it's his fans. We think that's where he should be, being a legend. And I know what you're saying about Furlan, but I think that by moving Yager to line one, you could do more damage to the Jankowski-Bennett line than you might help the monahan Goudreau line. I think even if Furland is struggling a little bit, he's probably the better fit on line one in order to secure the strength of line three. Because I think if you if you just swap those two guys, Furland for Yager, I think that a Bennett Jankowski Furland line is not going to be nearly as effective. True. So I think and, sometimes yeah, you almost it, keep one guy where he is to make another line stronger. Yeah, and it would also be potentially viable to swap Versteeg in with Furland as well, if that was the case. So Yeah, Versteeg keeps looking better. I think that would be a better solution is trying Versteeg on line one than it would be to move Yager off line three. I think we're starting to see the third line there with Yager, Janko, and um, Bennett almost be like the 3M line where you just don't want to touch it. Those yeah. guys have chemistry in and of themselves that's bigger than the sum of the parts. Yeah, and like especially with Yager and Jankowski both being bigger-bodied players, it, that line seems to work well in terms of puck control just because of the fact that uh, the other teams just can't push those players off the puck, and it, it creates time and space. And just like uh, you saw with Jankowski's second goal, uh, Yager was creating a little bit of space in the corner and found the the lane for, to fire the puck over to Jankowski, who just made it look easy. Well, Matt, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, we were talking about goaltending, moving away from that line. We saw Mike Smith go out in the St. Louis game. Uh, it was reported to media after the game that there was no prognosis on Mike Smith. We didn't know where he was going to be at. And even the next morning, this morning, we were told we didn't know if he'd go on the road trip or not. It's now being reported by a friend of the show, Ryan Pike, that Mike Smith did not join the team on the road trip to Detroit, which means that only Eddie Lack has gone as a goaltender. That doesn't mean Smith won't be joining them later on the road trip, but at least for one game, the Flames are going to have to bring a player up from the farm. Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that this player stays up for the whole road trip. The question now becomes, if you're the GM, who do you bring up? Gillies, Riddich, or Parsons? Well, if it's for, just say, the Detroit game, then I would just bring up Riddich, just because he's the AHL backup, and why rock the boat down there? He's not likely going to play at all anyway either in the A or up here, so just throw them in. If it's for the entire road trip, I think you bring up Gillies just to, because he would like, because they play so many games on this road trip that you can't just ride Lack through the whole bunch. So it, you'd probably throw Gillies in there for one of the games, especially next week, because I think the Flames play five games in seven days or something. Yeah, the Flames play essentially six games in 12 days, and if you look at next week, they're playing every other game, and they also, or every other day they have a game, and they also have a back-to-back -back Friday, Saturday. Yeah, so like it, it's you would have to expect that one of the those games, you'd have to put Gillies in just because of the fact that of that fact and Parsons hasn't played very well in uh the ECHL which isn't really a surprise because new league and all that so uh, he while he has the most potential of everybody he's still learning the pro game so you don't bother with that especially if he's not going to play so you just let him. Do you him think that then you call McDonald up to the AHL to sit on the bench and give Parsons some more time for the next week in the ECHL? Yeah, that's exactly what I'd do. And, then, and I don't and know where Mason the ECHL would source a backup goaltender, but then they'd have to find somebody. Yeah. Well, Mason McDonald's actually doing fairly well in the ECHL thus far this season. So uh, he is hopefully figuring things out and regaining his stature as a goalie prospect. It's an interesting challenge to look at the goaltending and figure out who you'd bring up. Both Gillies and Redditch are playing really well. Gillies has played more games. He's 4-3-1 and one with 2.5 goals against average and a .918 save percentage this season. 
Riddich is 4-1-0 with a 2.2 goals against average and .928 save percentage. He has played, I believe, five games now and has two shutouts. So Riddich has the better numbers, but Gillies has played more. I'd almost be tempted, if if we're assuming a goaltender's coming up for the whole trip, to find a way to split it. Bring um, Gillies uh, or bring Riddich up at first. Let Lack play Detroit, Philly, Washington. Switch the goalies and then have Gillies on the bench for Columbus, Dallas, and start him against Colorado. I think if you're going to start a game for your AHL goalie on this trip, it's Colorado. Yeah, I can see that. But I also think that with Mike Smith being in the condition he's in and the fact they weren't even sure if he was going to miss the trip or not, I'd be surprised if Smith isn't back by Colorado. I think that the Flames play Wednesday in Detroit and not again until Saturday in Philly. I could see Lack playing those two games, and my get, I would be shocked. My guess is that Smith comes back by Monday the 20th. That's what I'm expecting as well. The Flames are going to want to rush him because he is a, you know, he's the starter. And if we rush him, this could be a bad thing if he doesn't come back. But I also think this is now Lack's chance to shine. If you remember last year, we didn't have a lot of confidence in Chad Johnson. We didn't really know what we had there. And he got on a little bit of a run where he got some starting minutes. And we really got to look at him and say, okay, this guy is serviceable. I think this might be that time for Eddie Lack. Yeah, and as we've seen with Mike Smith the last handful of games, he hasn't been quite as good as he was in the first month of the season. That said, he's not been bad, but, you know, there's some flexibility where if Lack comes in and steals the show, maybe you have a more even distribution of starts. But we'll see. And that's on Lack to try and push for more playing time. Yeah, and I see Lack starting Detroit. I see Lack starting Philly. I see uh, Lack starting Colorado just because second game of a back to back. So I think of these six games, we're probably going to see a split between the two goalies. But I'm really excited to see. I mean, I've been an Eddie Lack fan since he was in Vancouver. I don't want to say he's the next goaltender of the future here, but I think that Flames fans are giving him the short end of the stick right now. And I think I'm really excited. I don't know about, about you, but I think he can do this. And I think he can prove to be, I don't want to say a 1B, but I think he can be a really good backup this year. And I'm really excited to see what he's going to do in the next two games. Same here. And I'm looking forward to seeing how he plays. Um. Do you think if if we do bring up Riddich, do you think that he sees, unless Lack really stinks the place up, he sees any time in the Detroit or Philly games? I doubt it, unless it's like 5-1 or something like that, and then you just stick him in just to... Didn't he only play a period last year? Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what decision the Flames make, but if you think of all the decisions a GM has to make, saying, crap, I've got three good defensemen, who do, or sorry, three good goaltenders, who do I call up? This is a, a position a lot of GMs would love to be in. I know. It's like, darn, I have too many awesome players to choose from. Gee, you know, my decision is just so tough. Long well, long since the days where your recalls consist of Jason Morgan, Jason Morgan, and Jason Morgan, like back in 2004. You forgot Kevin Lalonde. Oh, yes. Yes. I almost wonder if you're going to see Treliving put one goalie's name in each hand and tell Connie to pick a hand. Yeah. That's who we call up. Oh, you picked the Riddich hand. All right, make the call. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't see how you make this decision besides, I think, the fact that, like you said, Gillies, I, I still think the flame see of, of Gillies and Riddich, I think the brass sees Gillies as the goalie of the future from the two of them. So I think you're right. If it's just going to be a guy to sit on the bench, it's Riddich. Yeah. If you're seeing playing time, then Gillies. Yeah, and no, I totally, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I'm hoping it's nothing bad with Smith, but good on the Flames and good on Smith for taking him out of that game. I think, you know, if this were five years ago, he would have played all the way through. But good on yeah. the team and, and good on him for identifying he needed to come out. Yeah, and it was just one of those situations where in the last like three games he's gotten banged up a little bit in each of the games and it, I think it's just a collective you know having 
minor like six minor injuries all together at the same time and it's like eh, i need to rest <laughs> yeah i think this is an excuse for him to rest for a bit and i think we're also at a position now where he can do a little bit more of that yep well matt we have now as a team the calgary flames played 17 games of the 82 that we have this year which means we're nearing the 20 game mark and sort of that quarter point of the season if you take a look at the Pacific Division right now, it's pretty close. We've got Los Angeles leading the division at 24 points. I never thought I'd say this. Las Vegas second in the division with 21 points. And then San Jose and Calgary tied for third at 20 points. And Vancouver at 18, Anaheim at 17, Edmonton at 16, and Arizona 7. Looking at the way the Flames are playing right now, looking at the way our opponents are playing, and looking at sort of your prediction for the season, what do you think the chances are that the Flames push for a Pacific Division title this year? Uh, I think that you have to figure the Flames were right basically where they are now while having no depth scoring. If those guys get going... And you're getting scoring from all the lines instead of just Gaudreau's line and Kachuk, then the Flames instantly become the favorite not only for the Pacific Division but the Western Conference. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go as far as the Western Conference, but I definitely think the Pacific Division. Well, you have to figure that it's just basically LA and St. Louis that are drastically far ahead of Calgary. Everybody else is within three points. So, you know, it's one of those situations where you look at organizational depth and Calgary's a deeper team by quite a fair margin than Los Angeles. And I'd argue that they're a better team than St. Louis. So, you you know, it's one of those situations where we've struggled in the early part of the season due to the fact that it was basically the Gaudreau show. And now if the team's going to get quality secondary scoring, then look out. Like, the Flames have only scored 51 goals, and 20 of those were in the, uh, the last four games. So that's a huge amount of goals that in such a short amount of time they only had 31 in their first 14 so or 13 games pardon me so like if they're getting more towards like four goals a game three four goals a game instead of two goals a game you're going to start see the wins piling up because the goaltending isn't bad enough where they're going to be giving up four or five six goals a game you know, you were mentioning the Flames struggled, and it's it's interesting to call it a struggle because, yeah, we weren't getting scoring from the bottom, you know, six forwards, but it was the Gaudreau show, and the Gaudreau show kept us in the season. I mean, we're at 20 points. We're, even with Gaudreau doing all the heavy lifting so far, we're still in this race. I mean, if Gaudreau wasn't doing what he should have been doing, we could be where Edmonton or Arizona are. So, you know, yeah, as a team we struggled, but as an organization – I think the Flames have held their own. And I totally agree with you. Now that everyone else is starting to get goals, I think we're going to see the Flames rocket up the Pacific Division. I think Vegas is about to fall fast. Yeah, and same I here. You know, they, I mean, they're down to what? Their fifth goaltender now? Yeah, something like that. You know, Fourth or ne- fifth, yeah. Next so. guy they'll call is Freddie Brathwaite. Pretty much. You know, like um, it's getting to the point of being ridiculous. Or they'll be the next team to call Niemi when Montreal's done with them. Yeah. Um, the, the traveling Niemi plays for all 31 teams in the one season. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> you get him for tonight. No, you get him for tonight. <laughs> we'll get him every second Saturday. And No, but I mean, if Niemi were to play in Calgary this year, that means Smith has gone down, Lack has gone down, Gillies has down. gone down, Riddick yeah. has gone down, Parsons has gone down, McDonald's has gone down. We might as well just raise the white flag at that point. Yeah, and Nick Schneider got ran over by a bus. And At no. that point, <laughs> I'd still rather probably sign Jordan Siglet to a one-year deal. Yeah. Or a one-game deal, even. Yeah. You know, before I put Niemi in. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, enough Niemi. Um, but... 
yeah, I'm I'm really looking at this right now. I don't just my my heart tells me Calgary's not going to win the Pacific Division, but I think Calgary's going to challenge for it. I still think San Jose and LA are going to be going back and forth for the top of the Pacific, Pacific Division. I think we'll be out of it by one or two points. As much as we have a better team, I just think those teams I don't know. San Jose still got a good makeup to that team. They're a li- they're on the downswing, but not as much as I think they will be next year. And I think that LA is going to fizzle out a bit, but I think they can pick up enough points early to last them late in the season. Yeah, I just still think that Calgary has the best overall depth in terms of both the forward and defense. Like, yeah, Los Angeles has and. Uh, arguably San Jose have better goaltenders, but the Flames are pretty much right there w- in, with Smith. So, you know, it it's a long season, but I still think the Flames could end up being like a 105, 108, 110 point team at the end of the year. So we'll see. It, they have a lot of g- games to play, obviously, 65 remaining, but... Uh, I if they are getting contributions from everywhere in the lineup, uh, it's gonna be tough to beat them. Looking at the Pacific Division right now, I think by the end of it, you're gonna pretty much see the teams in this pretty much same order they are now. The big difference, I think, is Vegas and Anaheim are gonna switch. Yeah, and Vegas. Vegas isn't gonna stay in the top four, and I don't think Anaheim stays in the bottom four. I think those guys will switch. Edmonton's the interesting dumpster fire of the year to me. Well, Edmonton, I think anybody could have that wasn't being swayed by McDavid could have seen that coming. Like they're going to be they, saved by Mike Camilleri. Oh yeah, gee, you know, you look at them like they have McDavid and Drysaitel performing, which great. You know, you have two awesome players. Can't argue there, but you look at the rest of the lineup. And my God, is it a terrible hockey team? Well, I just still look at the blue line. I've said this every year. Like when Chris Russell's in your top three, something's wrong. He, I honestly don't think Chris Russell would be playing in the lineup if he was in Calgary. I, I think even Brett Kulak is a better player than him. It's one of those, I just don't see Edmonton bouncing back. Like, yeah, they're only three points out of a playoff spot, but... I still, and I've said this since the beginning of the year, my crystal ball tells me Talbot gets hurt. I would not I just be think shocked by that. I would not. I just think it's, and I've said this since the preseason. I've even said to you, I think, I think Talbot gets hurt this year. I think Edmonton, their GM is too smart to overpay for a goaltender just because Talbot's hurt. I think he tries to run with what he's got and they just keep falling and falling and falling. I mean, yeah, Swa yeah. cannot handle 60 games. No, and I think that the team itself, like, if you manage to shut down the McDavid line, you only have to really worry about Ryan Nugent Hopkins, which is not that big a deal. And uh, there's nothing else. Like, there's just nothing. There is literally nothing on that team. It's... Like, honestly, I think Versteeg and Brower would be on their second line. Like, it, it's a really crappy team. Out, Like, if you take out the two good players, there's just nothing. And There's Mike Camilleri. Oh, yes. The vaunted savior. And I feel sorry for Mike Camilleri. Uh, yeah, if he's listening at all to the show or, you know, anybody who knows Mike Camilleri, I'm sorry that you got traded to Edmonton. I feel really bad for you. <laughs> Tange and Iggy are available. Yeah. Let's put them back together. Yeah. Robin Regeer is available. Bring him out of retirement. Glenn Cross and Sarich are doing nothing much. So, hey. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I, I look at this and I think you could be right. I think Calgary has a chance to take the Pacific. But I just look at teams like I think San Jose and LA who, you're right, they have better goaltenders, but I just think that they're more veteran-laden than Calgary, and I think sometimes that plays an intangible role. 
Um, I don't think that they're going to go further. I don't think San Jose, for example, might go further in the playoffs in Calgary, but I don't think this is necessarily Calgary's specific division to take. I'm going to throw out my early season bold prediction. The matchup we saw yesterday of St. Louis Calgary will be the Western Conference Finals. Wow. And how do you think that who do you think ends up winning that series? The red team. I think Calgary's just a tiny bit deeper. So and I think that's the difference. Well, how so, many more times do we face them this season? Twice. So we'll see. I mean, that's a four game series, right? So we yeah. can see how do we look in a four game series against St. Louis? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just think because usually the teams that go deep in the playoffs tend to, unless they get like a Yaroslav Halak type goaltending performance from a few years ago, usually the last four teams are the deepest organizationally. And like your star players do carry you a long way, but like even like uh, the years that LA won the cup, uh, like, yeah, they weren't ranked high. But they were very, they were four lines deep in terms of talent, and they have good defense and good goaltending. And it, Calgary and St. Louis, I think, are the two deepest, well built teams in the West. I think Dallas is not, I think Dallas, like Calgary, they haven't picked things up yet, but I think Dallas has got a pretty good team this year as well. I think they might I agree. Surprise. Yeah, I think they're, they could do well. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you there. I think Dallas, just looking at their division, I think they're going to end up in yeah. a wild card position for most of the season, but I think they could come in as a wild card and surprise a team like Winnipeg. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think the top three in that division will end up being St. Louis, Dallas, and Nashville, with Winnipeg being one of the two wild card teams. And I think the Pacific, the top three teams will be uh, Calgary, Anaheim, and L.A. Do you think Vegas stays in a wildcard position? No, I don't see them even coming close to a playoff spot. I think they caught a lot of teams off guard because they started most of the season at home. And, you know, it being Vegas, that, you know, teams weren't uh, having proper away discipline, if that makes sense. So off ice discipline anyway. So I think that's where a lot of that stemmed from and i think that uh, i think there's also just that newness I, factor of hey let's go out there let's do something let's show these fans we can do this i think it's that you know new team it's like when a guy gets traded to a team and he usually does well after a trade it's like they've all been traded to a new team yeah and uh, i think that they're gonna slow down really quick honestly i think that they finish the season just above arizona so we'll see yeah, I think the what I think the Pacific Division is going to be the most interesting race in the West, if not in the NHL. I think in the East, not a lot of movements going to happen. I think, you know, and I'm not following these as closely, but um, you know, Tampa Bay is obviously a powerhouse there. Toronto, Ottawa, yeah, okay, they'll probably stay where they are. I think New Jersey is going to fall, but I think in the West, there's going to be the most movement. Like I think Winnipeg, Dallas will probably move. Vegas is going to plummet, and the question then is who sneaks into Vegas's spot? Probably Minnesota. Yeah, I agree. And um, like with the East, uh, the only team outside of the playoffs currently that I can see with a better than even chance of getting in is the New York Rangers. And I don't think that New Jersey retains a playoff spot all season. I think that because uh, especially because they're relying on a lot of rookies that I think once those performances start slowing down that they're going to drop like a rock. I also think this may be the year we see the Chicago Blackhawks miss the playoffs. I agree. Uh, too little talent, and I think they traded the wrong goaltender. I said last year, I think Darling's the right guy. I wanted Darling here. I think Darling would. I think Darling is the next sort of. You know, there's always that backup Cam guy who gets traded. Yeah, some, well, who gets traded somewhere and makes it like Dubnik. You know, I think I think that's Darling. I don't think Darling's going to do it in the market he's in necessarily, but I think he's the next emerging guy. Yeah, I can agree with that. 
So we'll see what happens there, but it's it's interesting to think about the Flames potentially going from, you know, a team that couldn't make it past the first round to potentially winning the the West and I th- or the Pacific. And if they win the Pacific, I think this team's got a good chance to go a couple rounds. Well, that's the thing. The Flames need to win the division because honestly, I don't want to play LA or Anaheim in round one. I'd rather face one of the wild card teams. And whether it's Winnipeg or Dallas or San Jose. Well, based on what we are just saying, it'll probably be, say, Winnipeg and Minnesota. Possibly. And, uh, like, I don't... Those teams are easier to beat. Like, no, I think we no, can beat the Jets, no problem. Yeah, like, no no playoff series is going to be easy. Like, it's just not... It's the playoffs. Give me a break. But uh, you want to... Like, if you're, say, having to play Anaheim in round one, well, if you manage to get past them, then you have to play the division winner in round two. And then if you get past them, then you likely are going to have to play the division winner in the central. Like, that's a really tough road to go down. Whereas if you win the division, you get a bit of a easier round in the first round, and then you get a tired team whoever beat up each other <laughs> the best in round one and you get them a little on the tired side so then you have a more fresh team you know you're not as burnt basically after the first round if you proceed on forward and you can have a slightly easier chance of it in round two we're definitely early in the season to be making playoff predictions, but I think this year the Flames are... I, I'm going to say right now, and I've said for a while, the Flames I don't think are built to take home Lord Stanley's mug. Could it happen? Sure. I don't think this is our year yet, though. I think that this team has to make it to round two, if not round three, and that's a success for this year. Honestly, I think that the team could actually do it this year, and... Like, especially if they have all the lines rolling properly, uh, it, the Flames will be a hard team to beat. So, could they win the Cup? Possibly. And uh, I, you could say the same thing for a lot of teams like Pittsburgh, Tampa, St. Louis. So, I just think that there's going to be some tough Eastern teams. And if the interesting thing to me is if we make it to the finals... I think it'll be Calgary Tempa. And that's kind of a cool rematch of 04. Yeah. I just think Tempa is the hottest team in the league right so now. So keep Sam Bennett away from, the, <laughs> you know, he's had two goals not counted where he scored already. You know, we don't need a Jelena repeat <laughs> if that happens. Well, Jelena's on the team, so maybe Jelena can sit down with him and, you know, talk to him about what to do. Jelena's what, also, what, I think. I lift think it's the puck. Lift Jelen the is puck. The video guy. <laughs> yeah, lift the puck. <laughs> well, Jelen is the guy, from what I understand, who actually does the like replay reviews. Yeah. Bennett, so could... lift the puck. <laughs> Let's practice that. Lifting the puck up and over. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need it just going over the line and there being a video review. You don't need to be screwed for a third time. That's so. right. You remember? Do you remember in the '90s when Fox had those puck tracks with the purple line on it? Yeah. You almost need one of those for the refs, so they can see if it's actually in or not. I agree. I have a friend who has one of those pucks. I know. I remember, like, if the puck went in the crowd, they actually would get the ushers to go give them a puck and take the like mechanical one back. Yeah, I have a friend, and his dad was working at Fox. So when they shut the program down, they had some left, and he got one. Um, and it's yeah, the puck is—I don't know—it's weird. There's like a hole in it where you can see the stuff inside. Yeah. Well, anyway, enough. We're getting off topic with the Emmy and the mechanical pucks, and I don't know. There's—I uh, I guess we're so confident in the Flames, we can talk about other stuff. Yep. Well, let's look back at our poll from last week. We asked our listeners, which bottom six forward do you think will get the most points this season? And the number one result, no surprise to me, was Mark Jankowski got 50% of the votes. Matt Stajan, Troy Brower, Freddie Hamilton got zero votes. I mean, Brower, probably not. Stajan and Hamilton aren't even playing. 
and 16% of the votes went to uh, Chris Versteeg, Sam Bennett, and Curtis Lazar. So I think of this whole group, I think Jankowski is probably the one that will get the most points of those guys. We didn't put Yager in there because we didn't know where Yager would uh, would be when he came back. But I think if Janko gets a point in a lot of cases, Yager's going to get a point. Yeah. And, you know, if Yager gets like 40 points this season, which he's on pace to do so, what more could you ask for from For a million bucks, that's a great investment. Yeah. Like, give me a break. That's awesome. Matt, you and I talked about how confident we are that the Flames are going to make the playoffs, not just make the playoffs, maybe run for the Pacific or the West or even Lord Stanley's mug. This week, we're asking our listeners, as we reach the quarter mark of the season, how confident are you that the Flames will make the playoffs? And we want to hear your votes on this. So as always, you can go and vote at firesidechat.ca right on the homepage. You can go to our Facebook page, where facebook.com slash firesidechat, or on Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast, and we'll have the poll up there on all three of those places. We want to know how confident you are the Flames make this play the playoffs. Do you think it's definitely a shoe in Do you think maybe there's still some uncertainty? Or maybe you think we're going to fall faster than the Oilers? We want to hear what you think, and we'll let everyone know next week. But I think it's always good to check in at the quarter points to see how everyone thinks that we're doing. Anything else you want to talk about, Matt? No, I'm just looking forward to the upcoming road trip and hopefully with the Flames playing some slightly less good teams that hopefully they can get on a bit of a roll. Um, like it w- They've won four of their last five. I think if they can win four of the six games on the road trip, that would be awesome. And hopefully they're just going to start rolling along and shooting up the Western Conference standings over the next couple of weeks and into December. They've been home since Halloween. We'll see if they actually remember how to play a road game at this point. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a great time for the Flames to put up some big points and get a little bit ahead in the standings, and you always want that cushion. So the Flames are about to embark on a six-game road trip, six games in 12 days, which means they pretty much play every other day. They'll start the road trip on Wednesday the 15th in Detroit. That's a 5.30 p.m. Mountain start time. Then they get a couple days off. On Saturday, they have a matinee game. We never do well on matinees against Brian Elliott, our former goaltender in the Philadelphia Flyers. Then they get Sunday off. And on the 20th, we have the rematch against the Capitals, who are probably going to be out looking for blood. So, Matt, what's your prediction on those six points on the table? Six points. You think we sweep them all? Why not? Even the matinee. Sure, why not? It's Brian Elliott. Come on. Watch, they'll <laughs> they'll deliberately put their backup in, and we'll get another hot backup and lose that one. Yeah. I don't even know who the backup is in Philly. Isn't it Newverth still, or? Is he still there? I'm not By then, sure. it'll probably be Niami on his world tour. Yeah, true. Um, I wish we were playing against uh, Montreal right now. Oh, cause... I know. Montreal... I... Honestly, if they were smart, they would trade Carey Price and like uh, the veterans and go through a proper rebuild. But they don't think properly. Their management I, I is doubt, crap. I doubt you'll be able to move Carey Price. I mean, I bet he has a no movement. Yeah. Well, honestly, if it was me and like I was in charge, I'd be trying to pry Galchenyuk from their team and for whatever as long as the price is right uh, because that's a player that looks like one of the Oilers players that like it, once they got away from that team exploded into what they were because uh, he just looks like he's struggling because of the fact that he's playing with Montreal and I think a change of scenery will make him a good player so if the Flames can get him that would be awesome but you know that I think anybody who can pry him off of the Canadians will be getting the better end of the deal. On this, I, I think Gelchen, I think Gelchenyak will probably end up moving if the if they're out. I think he could be probably the biggest deal at the deadline. I think him and James Neal might fetch the biggest prices at the deadline. Well, let's go back to this week. I think you're going to do six. 
I'm going to say four. I think we'll beat Detroit. We'll beat Philly. I think Washington's going to come back with a vengeance, and I think they'll probably end up beating us by a narrow margin on Monday. All right. So we'll see how things turn out, and then after that, we got three more games on the road before the Flames come back again. So it's, I don't know, it's not, looking at the schedule for this month in December, it's not that bad a schedule for the Flames. No, the next two months are relatively easy. Like, there's, of course, there's no easy games, but we're not playing the elite teams night in and night out. No, and we also have a lot of, like, two- and three-day breaks, especially in December. Like, we play on the 22nd and then don't play again until the 28th. So, get a nice long Christmas break, which I think is important, you know, for, like we were talking about earlier with Smith. These guys are getting banged up, and even on this road trip, you know, they get two days off there, and two days can mean a lot. Definitely. Well, Matt, let's see how this road trip starts off, and I will talk with you next Tuesday. Thanks for listening, everybody, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.